And so this is a, a gradual slow takeover from uh, shadowy elite groups, which are in themselves really run by uh, Fortune 100, Fortune 500, the top root, uh, richest families in the world. Uh, they run through entities like the Bank for National Settlements, which is sort of the central bank of central banks. They're connected together with all the biggest private foundations, NGOs, think tanks. They're all working towards the exact same goal that I'm telling you. And all of the books say this. That's why this is so crucial to look at their writings, their white papers, and their, te their techniques and tactics. And what we see in the SPARS document and the, the lockstep document <clears throat> is they're always a few steps ahead because they're planning for the failure because they want the existing system to collapse. Now, it may not be overnight. It may not be an economic collapse tomorrow. It may not be an EMP tag tomorrow. It may not be a cyber polygon tomorrow. But we might see staggering versions of these things in the next 10 years, again, getting us to the goals of 2030, 2040, and 2050. Those are key decades, key, key periods where they want to have certain things complete in their long-term game plan up to 2050. 2050 is slated to be the full-on total AI DPOP global government. That's the, the year they've chosen in many, many documents. There might be a little variation, but basically by 2050 is the goal to have the full-on uh, Brave New World technocratic nightmare in, uh, Terminator Skynet system in place. So here we are, you know, a few decades out from that. What are the things we're going to see in the next few decades? The best way to understand what's going on is to get out of this model of thinking that it's government ruled by incompetency. We're not ruled by incompetent people. We're ruled by highly competent psychological warfare experts and corporate elite who have a layer of government control out in front of them that takes all the heat. And as I was looking back through uh, the Rockefeller lockstep document, I was reminded of the fact that in the scenario of lockstep, which, by the way, I'm glad Alex hit on that this week because it ties in with the SPARS document. Did, did you notice that what has happened in the last uh, week ties in perfectly with what these documents said would be the next phase of the plan? They said that in the wake of corruption, CDC failure, Fauci failure, et cetera, they don't mention Fauci by name, but they are basically talking about these characters, there would be a public outcry against the failure of the medical system as it is, a public outcry against the politicians, outcry against these officials that botched, failed, mismanaged, and so forth. Now, if you remember back to, to the events of uh, the Big Nine, right? Uh, we had a lot of people come out that analyzed the event and said, you know, sometimes in the world of intelligence, the biggest failures are the biggest successes. Why would that be? Well. In the wake of big failures, you get the justification for now we need to overhaul the system. Now we need billions more in funding. Now we need mass surveillance everywhere. Now we need to fix all the supposed flaws which the system actually wanted to be there to begin with. Think back to a few years ago, I think it was the people of the CDC, right? The head of the CDC was saying that it's time to blow up the old system intentionally. So what I'm trying to introduce to you is the idea that the problems, the chaos that occurs in the system is not there by accident. It's not something that was un, uh, not calculated in the big game plan. It was something that was part of the plan. They said in the SPARS document, for example, which matches up to, uh, to our years, even though it's listed as in the future, they said that after the outcry against the CDC and these different uh, agencies, the people would clamor for a salvation, clamor for something better because the existing system and its leaders, its politicians, were giant failures. Likewise, Lockstep noted that, quote, by 2025, people grew weary of the top-down control and the failures of their leaders. Sporadic pushback became increasingly organized and coordinated. Disaffected youth and people who saw their status of opportunity slip away uh, incited much civil unrest, and then it goes on to give examples of civil unrest, and it talks about how they clamored for, called for a salvation, somebody to come and save them after the world had basically in some way, in some various ways, collapsed in this scenario. And if you don't remember, this scenario was basically the COVID scenario. So this is a 2010 uh, uh, Rockefeller document that said that at, in the wake of the COVID, uh, what they call the, the Wuhan virus in the document out of China, Face masks, 
temporary uh, checks at airports and so forth. All of these controls would stay in place, biometric IDs for everyone, getting rid of cars in industry, shutting down travel, airlines, et cetera. This would lead to, eventually it even says the banning of cars, right, for the purposes of the green agenda. Innovation comes to a standstill and a halt. As a result, people cry out against their national government's failures. In the wake of crying out against these inept politicians, these corrupt leaders, corrupt presidents and prime ministers, they cried out and clamored for an international body that would help alleviate this, that would solve the problems of the politicians. If you know in my series, as we've covered the writings of the global elite, we've been through some 50 or 60, 60 if we count the white papers and on top of the big fat books and tomes that the elite have written, we know that they want to bring in a new plan. There's an existing system, the medical system, education system, the internet, uh, the economic system, right? There's these existing systems that they want to move into a new phase and replace. Most people think when they hear this kind of stuff or they're new to this material, they think that it's going to be a top-down tyranny. The government's going to march in and put you into this or that gulag. No, typically, I think in the documents, what we see is not a top-down immediate control. There is heavy-handedness at times. We saw during COVID, especially places like Australia, Mike, we had a lot of top-down control there. And it became a, a, a real 1984 hellhole. But that wasn't everywhere, and there was a lot of resistance, obviously. And so as a result, they, they realized that they would have to uh, gradually bring this in. And if you think about the Fabian socialist model, their image is a turtle. And so it's a gradual bringing in of the technocracy so that it goes unnoticed, right? So that it's not overnight. That's a much more effective way of doing this than the heavy-handed, iron-fisted bringing of the top-down control. So I want to go through about 10 signs that we're under siege and that this is actually a plan. Again, I mentioned two documents already that say that the outcry against the failure of public leaders would lead to the cry for an international global government, but which already exists, by the way. It's just kind of in the shadow, but it's now emerging, right? And we see it emerge most clearly through the Great Reset, which is really the, the uh, World Economic Forum, which is a public version or arm of basically Bilderberg. And so the key takeaway here is that they want you mad at politicians. You understand that a lot of the global elite writers believe in rule by experts, scientific government, they call it, the managerial system, the managerial class, and thus the more ridiculous politicians appear, the more they believe that over time, people are going to clamor for and call for, yes, let me be ruled by AI. Let me be ruled by international UN bureaucracy. Let me be ruled by unelected elites. Because elections and these kinds of things, they just don't work, you see. That's where they want to go. That's the end goal. So here we are where we still have the elections, or at least the appearance of elections. At least local elections are a lot more, I guess viable than, than the presidential election at this point. And so how do we get, if we're one of the global elite, how do we want to think about it in their mindset, how do we get from here to there? Well, one thing that we would want to do is get people distrusting, disliking the existing system, which at least to in terms of its uh, public structure, runs on the basis of elected officials. Now, we know that the shadow government has had a big hand for, uh, according to Dr. Carol Quigley, a century in selecting and influencing uh, those big elections on a national scale. And increasingly, the, the global elite have been influencing local elections, especially in key areas in a lot of ways, and not just uh, elected officials, but also judges too, right? So this affects all the branches. And so this is a, a gradual slow takeover from uh, shadowy elite groups, which are in themselves really run by uh, Fortune 100, Fortune 500, the top uh, richest families in the world. Uh, they run through entities like the Bank for National Settlements, which is sort of the central bank of central banks. They're connected together with all the biggest private foundations, NGOs, think tanks. They're all working towards the exact same goal that I'm telling you. And all of the books say this. That's why this is so crucial to look at their writings, their white papers, and their, te their techniques and tactics. And what we see in the SPARS document and the, the Lockstep document <clears throat> 
is they're always a few steps ahead because they're planning for the failure because they want the existing system to collapse. Now, it may not be overnight. It may not be an economic collapse tomorrow. It may not be an EMP tag tomorrow. It may not be a cyber polygon tomorrow. But we might see staggering versions of these things in the next 10 years, again, getting us to the goals of 2030, 2040, and 2050. Those are key decades, key, key periods where they want to have certain things complete in their long-term game plan up to 2050. 2050 is slated to be the full-on total AI DPOP global government. That's the, the year they've chosen in many, many documents. There might be a little variation, but basically by 2050 is the goal to have the full-on uh, Brave New World technocratic nightmare in, uh, Terminator Skynet system in place. So here we are, you know, a few decades out from that. What are the things we're going to see in the next few decades? The transition that the elite have planned, the global uh, technocrats have planned to move us away from the previous system into the new system which is ruled by experts, scientific government, supposedly. It's not actually scientific. It's just complete oligarchy and control, but it's given the title scientific governance. Now, what's the deal here? Why do they want to do this? Well, on the one hand, it's kind of true that politicians are ridiculous, right? I mean, not all of them, but, but for the most part, kind of everybody senses that there's just something off with the fake two-party system and the idea of, well, you only get these two options and everything is boiled down to basically uh, an oversimplified choice of some person, uh, you know, hundreds of miles away, a thousand miles away in D.C. that you don't know anything about other than the slogans that you've heard them say on the TV. And everybody knows that they're, uh, you know, sort of bound to corrupt interests and to, to uh, private interests and whatnot. And so I think everybody kind of senses that there's something broken with the existing system. I'm not saying every politician is corrupt or bad, but on the whole, we kind of think that there's something just kind of goofy about this. It doesn't really make sense. So the, the legitimate criticism that one might have of the problems in the existing system is precisely what the elite are exploiting. That's the point I'm trying to make here, right? They're trying to say, look at all these problems in the politicians. Look at all the problems in the existing existing system. Look at how your, your money's uh, collapsing, it's inflated, which by the way is their own plans. They were the ones that planned for this fiat system, getting us away from sound currency and so forth, sound money. Uh, that's all by design. And then they blame everybody for their plans. We saw this, for example, in Bertrand Russell and many of the other writings of the elite that they would blame humankind for the invention of atomic bomb, nuclear bomb, and then say that, well, in order to save humanity for the evil inventions, we're going to have to institute a world government to police all this. And then turn around and say, we, the elite, invented the nuclear bombs because we're smarter than everybody. I mean, literally constant doublespeak, constant lies, constant deception. But again, remember, the goal here is not to help you, not to lead you into a utopia, not to give you a fair system. It is to get rid of you and to put in place a system of complete 100% total technocratic control. And eventually it, 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 would, it would be not run by humans, but by computers, a complete AI system running supposedly on perfect math and logic. Then it could bypass human weaknesses, human emotionalism, human flaws. That's the idea, right, of technocracy. Now, I think it's kind of crazy. It's, it's something more akin to a cult, not a cult, but a cult, a belief in the idea that you can have a perfect system run by computers. It's kind of ridiculous. But that's what these people do put their hope and faith in. So what are the signs then that we're under siege being moved into this kind of a system? Again, to put us under a managerial class of rule by experts that is always contrasted against, and will be, especially in the, in the coming years, contrasted against the folly of the corrupt politician. Look at Biden. Look at all the scandals. Look at this. They're so silly. They're so goofy. Don't we need rational governance? Don't we need computer governance that's not subject to the flaws and scandals of some goofy politician, some ridiculous boomer who can't even figure out how to use the bathroom, right? I mean, doesn't that sound kind of reasonable? That's what it's playing on. Look at how Fauci failed us. Look at the failures of government. But the reality is that they want to bring in a more heavy-handed governance. Think about Batman Dark Knight as an example. If you remember, in the plot, you have 
the character Bane, who is sort of this revolutionary, right? He comes from the Far East and he pops up as this mysterious figure in the underworld. And he engages in all these uh, actions of well, terror, basically, right? throughout Gotham. Uh, he uh, collapses Gotham's you know, stock market and he does all these uh, you know, revolutionary terror events. And he talks about all the corruption in Gotham. And he's right. Right. I mean, there, there's a lot of corruption. There's there's crime. There's and he's actually working with this and doing more organized crime and chaos to bring about the collapse of the existing Gotham system, because in his mind, it's all justified because I was born in adversity. Right. He was born in adversity. He was born in the flames of, you know, struggle and darkness. And so for him, it's justified to bring in this better system. But what happens when. Bane comes to power. Do you, guys, do you guys remember in the plot? Well, it's an even worse system, and it mimics the French Revolution, right? There's guillotines, and you have, uh, you know, Sandman, Killian Murphy's up there sitting up up, up top this, uh, uh, you know, pyramid where he's judging everybody and off with their heads, and it's very reminiscent again of the French Revolution. Uh, he's sort of a Robespierre kind of figure, uh, and it becomes a, a total chaos. So it's even worse. The system that Bane brings in. The revolutionary system is even worse than the already existing Gotham, you know, elite structure, which I guess you could say Bruce Wayne represents sort of the billionaire oligarch character, right? Versus this revolutionary anarcho-communist system that Bane wants to bring in, and it's even worse. And it's even more corrupt, you know, everything just falls apart. So the reason, again, that the elite love revolutionary movements and they, they love the kind of radicalism that we're seeing pushed everywhere is because it's a wrecking ball. It's there to destroy the existing system. And the liberal revolutionaries, these kinds of people, they're just the dupes who are the tools of the system that think that they're going to profit from it. They're going to be in power. They're going to get uh, goodies out of all this. It's going to be, you know, they're going to be the ones that are the, the, the true, uh, you know, heroes and this kind of stuff. And they're the ones that, of course, always go out first because the, the revolution isn't run and isn't based on what they think it is. It's actually run by rival oligarchs and rival elites. Likewise, the system wants us to be furious at the notion of a nation state. The nation state's the failure. The existing healthcare system is a failure. It's got to be replaced. And all of the movements that we're seeing are about that. The family is an oppressive structure. The family is a patriarchal structure that is uh, oppressive and it rapes women and it, you know, all of this nonsense. And that is just totally a cover, 100%, for depopulation to make sure that you don't reproduce. That's it. That's the only purpose of that. There's no other purpose than that. So the movement and attack on biological gender, the attack on men and women at the same time, it's a two-pronged attack, right? They want you to either be this crazy purple-haired feminist social justice warrior or this uh, freak incel guy who you know hates women. That's, that's a two-pronged social engineering, 100% engineered attack. So the removal of the family is key. And that's what all the global elites say. Get rid of the family because the family is a firewall. It's a kind of progenitor of a tradition, of a heritage. And just like nation states are bad, so little bitty nation states, aka families, are bad. Right? Think about the nation. Think about the state that you live in, or the U.S. and the states. Then smaller, you get your city. Then smaller, you get your family. All of these are firewalls. They're, they're kind of like... Uh, uh, walls, concentric circles inside your city protecting you from something bigger. And so to understand that we're under siege, you have to understand that the culture is all geared towards destroying all of that, to just wrecking ball, mowing down the whole thing. Every area of society will be overhauled and changed. And the easiest way to do that is not to logically debate with people to try to convince them of globalism, not to do this, but to actually just let the forces of chaos, controlled chaos, erupt and destroy the system from within with the promotion of the elites who want to bring it in, promote the radical causes, because it destroys the existing order to bring in the new order. Looking at the 10 signs that we are under siege and that the siege is intended to collapse the country, the West, by design, to bring us into the new system that the elites have planned, particularly the technocratic elites. So we talked first about the attack on humankind themselves in the sense of gender, family, 
uh, I want to add to that. Number two would be the attack on tradition, the attack on religion, the attack on people maintaining their own heritage and passing that on through a family. And a family is just a little bitty sort of transmitter of a tradition, right? It's a, it's a little society that then transmits these traditions. And if you want to destroy a nation, if you want to destroy a country or a, or a people group or a continent, one of the key ways to do that is not just go after the notion of the family and, and picture it as this uh, oppressive uh, structure, this uh, fascist patriarchal structure. You also want to go after the conception of religion because religion is something that binds the people. It holds them together as a commonality, right? And even though in the in the U.S. we have various uh, you know different religious groups, there are still dominant religions in the West, such as Christianity, which have a kind of a, gen, a general idea that people follow relating to the Bible, relating to you know uh, common law, Roman law, et cetera, all part of this heritage of the Western tradition. And so it's thus necessary to break that down, to destroy that in order to destroy the existing culture. All of this is from the same structure, the same power group that intends on moving Americans away from people in the West, anything resembling traditional ideas at all. So while it's true that at times it's necessary to debate amongst various groups and churches and religions and whatnot, we do have to do that. From the vantage point of the elite, they don't really care about that so much as they care about making sure that anything healthy, anything wholesome, anything traditional, got to go. So it's all painted as uh, fascist, as oppressive, as patriarchal and evil, because they're actually the things that are healthy, wholesome, and lead to a fulfilling, meaningful life. So the idea that you're going to have a meaningful, fulfilling life as an alone, consumerist, city-dwelling, uh, rootless bug man, as if that's going to give you fulfillment, is only going to make you miserable, only going to make you alone, atomized, alienated, and ready to step into your coffin, I mean Kumpod. That's it. That's the goal. So it's marching you to, leading you to your own self-willed giving up and collapse and death, self-destruction. That's the whole point of all of it. And that's also the point of the one world religion that's being engineered and steered through the big mainline churches and groups. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, as we said, those firewalls uh, is to, to get rid of one of those firewalls is the nation state. Now, you could argue that the nation state has been on decline for a long time, and that's true. But the reason they intentionally want it to be a problem is because their their only idea, their only goal here is to just say, don't you want the global government? You see? See all the problems of nation states? Look at the wars. Look at the chaos. Look at Russia versus America and the West. Russia versus Ukraine. Look at China versus this other. Look, don't you want a solution to all the wars? Is it, wouldn't it be rational and reasonable to not have all these wars? And that sounds rational, okay? But it, it's not reality. It's not realistic. It's a pipe dream. And so the demonization of the nation state is another one of these key elements and proofs of siege throughout all the global elite writings. They're all, to a man, 100% internationalists. There's no such thing as the nation state. It doesn't even exist. And so it, the existing structures have to fall but rather than attacking them in some overt way with another country or something like that, which may occur, they may engineer a, a giant global war, who, who knows? Why not just let them rot from within? And it's part of warfare, it's part of the history of warfare to attack in various means and in various ways, okay? Warfare is not just physical, you know, kinetic warfare. There's economic warfare, sanctions. There's siege, where you might attack people's food supply people's supply chains. There's ideological warfare, psychological warfare, cultural warfare. Let's flood this country with the most degenerate gross porn. Let's flood this place with uh, fentanyl and drugs by design as a form of warfare. Everybody knows the British did this, but why does this seem strange or something impossible when everybody knows, even every liberal has lectures out there about the opium wars, how Britain right, went to war in a covert way through flooding opium into China as a form of cultural warfare. Anybody with any sense can see 
that we are under 100% total cultural warfare attack. And you can go read people from the Pentagon, from the Army, who talk about this. Even some of the Satanists in the, in the Army, like Colonel Michael Aquino, who wrote the Army's uh, psychological warfare doctrine from Mind War to Psy War, where he talks about the masses are the real enemy here, you see. All of us. Right? The domestic population is the target, is the problem. Not everybody in the government is evil, not saying that. Not every corporation is evil. But the Fortune 100... Bank for National Settlements, the people that run the world for the most part, or at least the Atlantis' Western power bloc, they are 100% committed to the Malthusian agenda, and the end goal that they want to get us to requires going through these steps. So the collapsing of the nation state, key there, number three. Currency, right? Uh, money is a form of energy transfer, right? It's a symbolic representation of exchange or an exchange of energy time, right, is, is, is what it can stand for. So the way to, uh, another way to attack a country is to attack its currency, its means of exchange. Now, we've been under that kind of attack for a long time, all the way back to Jekyll Island, the Federal Reserve, all this kind of stuff, right? Because that allowed for a, not a government entity, but a private entity with a government face to control the printing uh, of the money, to control the money supply. So the money printer goes, brr, brr, right? And that deflates the currency. It makes the dollar have less purchasing power, less value. And especially after Nixon, the shock doctrine, we move off of the gold standard, it gets even worse. Now it's just pure fiat. But a pure fiat currency and inflation is a form of theft. It's actually robbing future generations of their wealth and robbing you in the present time of your wealth and your savings because the value of your savings just depletes over time, especially in the past couple of years, what, it's uh, it, it depleted like 10, 20% each year, something crazy like that. So attacking the currency economic warfare is a key strategy in this battle. And yeah, we know about, you know, the, the sanctions with Russia and the problems that in the economy via, you know, the, the war with Russia uh, in terms of Ukraine and the, the, the American sanctions. But in the long term, there's a much bigger uh, play at work here, which is to attack economics, period, to go after economics itself. The idea of attaining wealth, having personal rights and sovereignty, that's under attack because that will be transitioned into the notion of the universal basic in income, some version of Fed coin or a universal basic digital coin, which will be a centralized blockchain. Got nothing wrong with blockchains. There's different ones. There's decentralized things like Bitcoin. And then there's centralized things that are problematic. If you notice uh, Klaus and the World Economic Forum a few years ago, maybe two years ago, put out a list of their top cryptos that they think would be perfect for uh, world adoption because of their centralization control mechanism. Now, we were talking about the signs that were under siege to get us to the end goal of the global technocratic government. And so in order to get us there, you got to break the existing system. You got to explode it from within by design. What's the best way to do that? Is it to force it down everybody's throat, to crush the existing system uh, overtly? No, no, no. It's to let it fall apart and foster the forces of chaos and decay from within by design. That's how this system, that's the key to understanding what's going on. So we just talked about collapsing the currency to bring in the UBI to utilize the fiat system to run up the debt, the, the derivatives, bubbles, the, the, the housing bubbles, all of these bubbles that are intentionally created, which eventually over time have to give way. You can't run up infinite debt, right? What's the national debt? Trillions and trillions of dollars. You can't do that and expect the system to continue working. Eventually, it's going to fall apart. And everybody knows that since we've gone away from sound money, hard money, there's just, we're just kicking the can down the road. And the more that they print, the more inflation, the more stimulus checks that they give out, the worse it is down the road. Next up is increasing controls that, especially through the so-called chaos and pandemic and the fear, oh, got to scare the crap out of everybody. Now all of the controls that were seized, government controls, corporate controls, Oh, no, now you don't get any of that back. Even though everybody who questioned the last two years, everybody who questioned Fauci, everybody who questioned all that was right, even though we were all right, all of the power grabs that occurred, no, you don't get any of that back. 
Sorry. And that's what everybody who was a quote conspiracy there said, warned about. They're never going to give you back these liberties that they're taking under the guise of emergency powers. It was all a scam from the get-go. And this is what we said the whole time. I did a video about how the coronavirus and the whole thing was about economic integration, consolidation, and taking over. That was it. Now, I mean, it had other goals down the road. And how did I know that? Did I know that because of what well, was in this document? It was in lockstep. Right? I mean, they said in the first scenario that government will be heavy-handed, they will seize tremendous amounts of power, and they will do it in order to provoke the people. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? They're telling you that the intention was to make you mad, to provoke you, so that you do what? Well, it could be to get you to do crazy stuff, right? A kind of provocateur, agent provocateur type of thing. But it actually more likely is to get you to clamor and call out for their solution, problem, reaction, solution. They cause the problem. They get you to react. Then they give you the prepackaged solution. The whole thing. That's how the whole system works. And if you can't figure that out, you will constantly be gaslit and abused by the system. So tighter bureaucracy, tighter controls, which Spar's document and lockstep documents talked about, causing the public to cry out for their savior. But the savior is the system's package salvation, which is just deeper into the control matrix and the control chaos. More top-down control. Remember the uh, situation with masks, right? You would get con early on, oh, masks don't work. Oh, actually, they do work. Oh, but you have to uh, wear them because they don't work, but it's a sign of social conformity. And then it just got more and more ridiculous with the mask. Put them on in your house. Wear two masks. Wear three masks. Wear them uh, when you're uh, alone on the webcam so that you don't hurt people. I mean, just crazy stuff. So did... Uh, acquiescing make anything better? No, the more you gave in, the more you were abused. It's like a relationship, right? With a, an abusive guy or whatever. And the girls are always like, I can make him better. I can, I can fix him. I can change him. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. You're not going to fix big daddy corporate government. They're not going to start being nice to you because you keep going along with crazy nonsense rules. And the nonsense crazy rules are a form of psychological warfare too. Do you understand that? That's key to understand. They even said, what was it, the Harvard study, right? They even said the requirements about the mask and all this and the social distancing aren't about health. They're about conformity and psychological warfare and breaking people down. That's what they said. It was in the Canadian government's admissions and it's in the uh, NATO psychological warfare document because the Canadian government was running on the NATO PSYOPs documents in their strategy for pushing these things. Food attack. Attack the food. That's a key part of siege, right? So you got to be starved out, starve them out. So not just starvation, but attack on the logistics of the food supply. The, the mainline diet of the American itself is a psychological warfare attack. Okay, It's garbage, what most people eat. Okay, when you go in the grocery store, like all the stuff that is in the middle of the grocery store is not food. All the stuff that's on the outside ring, that's the food, right? The diet itself is it has been an attack for years, the corporate diet. Now it's getting even crazier because you're going to eat bugs and or you're going to eat human meat. So no more cows because cows destroy the environment, supposedly. That's all, all that is is an attack on your diet. And siege is a key. And in fact, all the global elites, whether it's Charles Galton Darwin, uh, Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, they all have chapters on food, controlling and taking over the food supplies to s not just starve people out, but transition them into diets that de genetically change them. That's how crazy it is. Food attack. Is that is that one of them? Yes. So we're under siege. Media censorship, control, toxic culture. Another key thing. Flood the culture with degenerate art, so-called. It's not actually art. It's just a weapon. That's it. And a large portion of the pop music, a large portion of the movies, the video games, the media is 100% just a toxic warfare attack on you. That's it. That's all it exists to do is to toxify your mind, to poison you with various lies and mind viruses. Not everything, but a large portion of it. 
Next up, halt innovation, bring in austerity. The push towards you not having a home, you not owning anything, the circular economy, you rent everything, including your clothes. There are people pushing this now. You won't even have it, own your own clothes. You won't own books. You will live in a pod and rent everything. Bring in total austerity, tiny living being pushed amongst millennials and zennials, right? Gen Z or whatever. Siege, we are under siege. So the last one, stage fear, expect more events, totally intended to just create fear so that we capitulate and so that we all cry out for salvation from the shadowy elites that actually engineer the chaos. They'll blame the politicians and then we'll run to them for an international salvation. 